Well, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Tommy Ender, and I'm an assistant professor of education studies and in the history department at Rhode Island College. I just want to thank Gorman and the rest of the folks at NERC for allowing me this opportunity to share out some work that I feel would be valuable to all of us currently. And I want to do a special shout out to a couple of my students who are here. So I'll let them introduce themselves at a later portion of this presentation, but I want to say hi to them. And, and so what I like to do is I'm going to share out my screen here. And hopefully I'll have an icon down below that will show me like a thumbs up or some sort of um, other icon. If you can see it, do let me know. Okay, judging by your silence, I'm gonna assume that you can see it. So welcome to my presentation, Using Music to Teach Citizenship and History too. And that the, that's my name right there, Tom Yander, Rhode Island College, that's my email address. And if you are socially media inclined, that's my Twitter handle. I uh, use that for professional reasons. Oops. There we go. And what I like to do is uh, I like to just give everybody a glimpse as to what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll do a little bit of an introduction about myself. And then I'm going to have all of you do a short activity. And then I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking about the issue of using music to teach citizenship and history too, around the question why and looking at music and citizenship and history in sort of separate but interconnected ways. And now I'm gonna revisit that short activity and that's gonna be an opportunity for all of you to share out what you've discovered in doing the activity. And then I'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions and answers. All right, an introduction about myself. Uh, previous to being a Rhode Island College, I was a social studies middle school and high school teacher for about 10 years. But even going, before, going back before that, I'm originally from New York City and I spent some time living in this building. And this building is formable in what I do today. It was a building where I got to experience life in many different ways definitions of what the world meant to me. And so as I started to figure out who I was in the world and what things I wanted to do, I realized that music was a significant part of it. I'm a 90s kid, I grew up in the 90s. So in that time period, I was exposed to great hip hop music that came out of New York City. I was also exposed to a great punk and alternative music scene that later came out in the early 2000s. So having two different genres playing out at the same time in one setting really influenced who I saw myself as, what I thought I was into, et cetera, et cetera. So fast forwarding to 2010, this is a picture of me and my daughter when she was four years old in front of my very last classroom. At this point, I had moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, and I helped open up a brand new middle school because there were a lot of folks moving to North Carolina. And I wanted to take this picture because then after I took this picture, my daughter and I went into that classroom and it's my beloved 13, 16 classroom, and we just started playing music. And at the time, you know, as, as any young kid is into, it's most likely wiggles and imagination movers and all that but the power of music really inspired her and she was just itching to go into that classroom and listen to music so I had my wife take a picture and then we went into our classroom and began there and as I started teaching that year and that was fall of 2010 I made it a point of including music as part of the learning and what I discovered a number of years later is that even when I keep in touch with a lot of the students from that time period, they will say, have you heard this artist? Have you seen this artist on YouTube, et cetera? And so knowing how music plays such a pivotal role and connecting that with our conversations, I want you to do the following. So on a piece of paper or in your mind or what other outlet you like to use, 
I want you to answer this question. How do you define citizenship education? Okay, because I know we're all coming from different parts of New England and the Northeast. And so the definitions may be a little different, but I want to give all of you that space to think about what is the definition of citizenship education. Then find a song that speaks to you. It may be from your time as an adolescent, maybe your time as a college student or as a current educator or whatever setting you're in. Think about a song that speaks to you, that connects with you in here inside your heart and up here inside your head. And then why? Simple question, why? Why does that song speak to you? Why does it speak to you here and up here? I'll give you about uh, 30 seconds to think of a song and to define that first question. Okay, so what I want you to do now is I want you to table that for later on in our conversations that will, that will take place after I present. But it's important that you think about this song as I talk about the, the ways we can include music in our teaching. So you'll see this question, why come up? I was the kind of, I was the kind of middle school and high school teacher and even today, as a teacher educator, I like to ask questions or I like to find out more. And a lot of times it comes from just asking the word question, why? So in this case, why music? So as I mentioned before, I spent 10 years teaching grades six through 12. And I realized that a lot of students were disconnected with what was being put together in the curriculum and how social studies educators taught students. And I realized that I had sort of an adaptive psychology when it came into teaching where I could sense that the students were disengaged. They were not interested, they found it boring. So I found different ways to make it relevant to them. And one of those ways was through music. I, as I mentioned before, I am a 90s kid. So I grew up with a compact disc. There was a study that came out around 2002, 2003 that discussed the amount of time adolescents in the 90s spent listening to music on compact discs. And the scientists, I believe, um, the number that it came to was almost 10,000 hours of music spent listening via the compact disc in a given year for somebody who was between the ages of 12 and 18 during the 90s, 10,000 hours. Fast forward from that study till today, with music streaming, Spotify, YouTube Music, Apple Music, um, Tidal, all other of these fast, easy to, ex to access type of music stream programs, that number is much higher. So know that the students that we have are constantly listening to music. In fact, I did a presentation, something similar to this last week for a number of students out in California, and a num uh, number of them said, oh yeah, in my high school, I used to walk around with earbuds in just listening to music in between classes to think that now we've gone from not having, you know, headphones when I was a high school student to now students just walking up and down the hallways listening to music tells me that music is very pronounced and very involved in the lives of the students. And then in a, in a specific reflection, I think back to my 10th grade US history course in the spring of 1994. I was one of those students who found studies, history, sociology, political science, very boring. It did not make any connections to my life living in that building and the neighborhood I grew up in and, and all that. And so when I had Mr. Augustine as my teacher, 
one of the first things he did was he would bring out this boom box. And I'm talking about these A's boom boxes that were about this big with the big speakers and it had the cassette in the middle. And instead of going into the syllabus or going into what we're going to be learning about, he popped in two tapes. This was the first one. If you are a hip hop fan, you may recognize this as the record Midnight Marauders by A Tribe Called Quest. And for many folks, you, this was the one record that really combined jazz and bebop and hip hop and the socially conscious lyrics of Q-Tip and Five Dog put together on a record. And for that 45 minute class, he played side A, left class thinking, wow, what is this? The next day, okay, so we're thinking, all right, let's see what's gonna happen now. He popped in this tape, Rage Against Machines, Rage Against Machines, the debut record. Same exact thing. He just played side A for the rest of the period. That set the tone for my metamorphosis into loving learning about citizenship and history because he made those connections. He made us understand that what we we're going to do as adults were connected to what we had heard through the music and what we experienced. And so those two records are the epitome of what I consider music as a form of education. And so transitioning over to citizenship education, one aim that we all have when it comes to teaching social studies, and I think this is pretty common across the, the spectrum across the United States, is that we're preparing our students to have the knowledge and have the skills and the values, the understanding for democratic participation. And so we, we engage with them when it comes to learning about the US Constitution, not learning the first couple of amendments, but learning all of them, or how an amendment is added to the Constitution, that it's a working document, or the right to vote, or anything that is connected to how we as a society can enact change. The, the question that I have continued wrestling with since 2003, that was my first year of teaching, is that what are the implications of citizenship education when it comes to actually teaching it and what we see on the curriculum? I got to see life before No Child Left Behind really took a hold. And then I saw what it did to social studies instruction. And by the time I left that classroom, that 13, 16 classroom in 2014, I was very dismayed with the way social studies had really become history centric. I thought that it needed to be more well-rounded, more, more emphasis on citizenship education. And so that's what inspired me to get this PhD where I am today, where now we're, we can have these conversations and I can have the research abilities to carry out, are there teachers out there who are already doing this in spite of what the curriculum says or how they're being told to teach? So from the years of reflection, and note-taking and doing research as an academic now, I've come up with this framework that I hope to start having conversations, conversations with you all about the, the, the importance of using music as part of the learning. And as I mentioned before, the first item here, music is influential. Talk to any adolescent in your classroom. They will easily tell you who their favorite artists are where they're getting their source of music, how they are consuming music. Is it through their phone, laptop? For those of us that remember vinyl records, vinyl records are coming back. Why? There's now a new generation of listeners that prefer to listen to music on vinyl. I never would have thought of that, but guess what? It's back. The other part is the emotional realism that many students have when they listen to the lyrics, the songs themselves. A lot of the artists are responding to what's happening in the world. And they're using their platform to share out those experiences. But what often gets ignored is the beats, the rhythms, the sounds that the artists put together. If, if you're into disco music or dance music, there's always a boom, 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 boom beat to it, right? It mirrors our heartbeat. When we get excited, boom, 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 boom. You hear that four on the floor beat from the disco era 
on the on the ba- on the kick drum or on the bass drum. Boom, boom, it connects to your heartbeat. Or for some aficionados of punk music, that boom, 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 that fast rhythmic beat. When you get really excited, what does your heart do? Or if you're into ambient music or deep house, that boom, 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 that slows the beat. You're relaxed. That all of those are different emotions that we experience. And the students that are listening to these songs, they're basing their realities around these different emotions. So you have this emotional realism that connects to music. And then obviously citizenship education, as I mentioned before, we are preparing our future participants on how to navigate the waters that, is, that we call democracy. And so these are, these are goals that I come up with, as, as I mentioned before, based on my experiences teaching both in the K-12 setting and in higher ed. And, three, and these goals are interconnected. They're not separate. They're not occupying individual spaces and not having any connections. They blend together. So you have music in the classroom, the idea of critical consciousness and critical self-reflection. And you'll notice this word critical. I, I, my philosophy behind the word critical is that you're asking questions all the time. You're not just complacent in receiving information. You take that information and then you return by asking questions for further follow-up or for more in-depth discussion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into each of these bubbles. So music in the social studies classroom, the lyrics, whether you are into an artist like Kendrick Lamar in hip hop or Bruce Springsteen or Billy Joel, or you're into um, um, Brad Paisley in country music or Kate Grace also in country music, the lyrics that they create, they're addressing particular events or time periods, or they're responding to things that are happening in our society. And the students, when they hear that over and over again, they're now formulating new aspects of their knowledge. And, that, and that's something that is very important that I did as an educator, where when students come in, they would have deficit views that, of their knowledge. They felt they didn't know enough. When in turn, I would use music and say, you actually have a lot of knowledge. Let's start figuring out how we can get these ideas and thoughts out of your head and onto the metaphorical or the literal paper. And through music, the students start becoming confident in sharing out different thoughts, or we can have debates on different topics. And third, and for me, something that was extremely important was the notion of building trust. In order for students to open up and share out their thoughts, knowing that in previous experiences, they weren't given that space or they were told otherwise, you have to allow that vulnerability to be shown. And for me, I always said, yeah, I relied on music because there were times that I went through that if it weren't for music, I would not be standing here. Now, a statement like that, many people would be like, whoa. But when you really think about it, I'm not sharing anything specific. I'm just opening up my vulnerability to the students to then say, well, what was it about the music or what happened? And, and, and one of those pivotal moments was actually when my father unexpectedly passed away in 2013 and I had to come back to New York to settle everything. And when I came back, the, one of the first things students asked me after they shared their condolences was, so who are the artists you were listening to? Immediately they knew because I had started off the year by saying, okay, I, music is very important. It helps me understand my world. How does music inspire you? And so that trust is there. They inform you, you inform them. Moving on to critical consciousness. The idea comes from a, an educational philosopher called Paulo Freire, who was originally from Brazil. And his ideas really became popular in the 70s and 80s in many education circles. And it kind of disappeared in the 90s and it has had a resurgence in the past 10 years or so. But it's looking at the idea that as teachers, we've been trained to fill in the minds of the students with knowledge when in fact, they already have knowledge. It's just trying to get them to share out. And so the notion of critical consciousness when it connects to music is that you're helping students reconcile all the different things that are around them, reading the worlds around them, 
things that are happening right now, especially with like the year that we've all experienced, 2020, everything that's been going on, students are wanting to talk about it. If they're given spaces in the classroom to talk about it, the, the conversations are fruitful. But unfortunately, from what I've gathered my research and from observations doing field work, a lot of teachers are not providing that space. And instead, the students are going on to social media. So that's something to think about. Also, it encourages questions. Again, I, I stress that with all my students, ask those questions. You want them to go in depth. You want them to have these multiple perspectives on a topic so that then when they're ready to vote, or when they're ready to participate in a jury, they know how to look at a particular topic, individual, idea, issue, and just look at it from all these different points of views. And in their mind, they would be asking questions. And lastly, resist passive learning. And this is something that I've taken up with uh, colleagues of mine within teacher education programs where the notion of writing the perfect lesson plan or strong classroom management or assessments, that takes precedence over actual instruction. How are you getting the students to engage with the materials? And it goes back to the notion of, are you just telling them what to think? Or are you asking the questions so that they in turn can say, well, I, I don't get it. Oh wait, how many of you look at it from this point of view? Or what would this group of people say? When you resist that passive learning and they become active and engage with it, then the students are understanding that what they're thinking is valuable and makes sense. And then lastly, critical self-reflection. For the students, especially adolescents who are between the ages of 14 and 18, a lot of science research will tell you that they're continuously reflecting on what they've done or what they've experienced. Think of you and I, when we were back at that age, how often were we paying attention to how we looked or how we acted or how we sounded around different individuals? It's continuous, they're reflecting. But in this case, when it's critical, they're asking the questions about what they learned. I remember we would uh, talk about, I'm trying to remember which amendment it was. Oh, we would talk about uh, the repeal of prohibition. And given that I, at that time I was living in New Jersey and a lot of students were like, yeah, duh, it makes sense. But then there would be a group of students that say, but, but why did we have prohibition in the first place? And the curriculum didn't address it. So we started digging into deeper and deeper into the causes of why, the, why prohibition came into being. And by the time the students were done with that unit, they want to learn more. And so their, their understanding of, but why? I, I don't get it. Why, why do we need this? It's continuous. For teachers, I tell these to my future educators that I currently work with at Rhode Island College. You never wanna be complacent. You never wanna reach the point in your career where you feel you know everything and you're literally phoning it in or mailing it in or whatever the students say today. Instead, you wanna continue enhancing your craft, whether it's an art or a science, education, teaching and instruction specifically has that lifelong impact on an individual. The more you continuously reflect from your experiences, the more you realize that you're doing it for the students. And that's, what, that's why we're all in this together because we want to help influence positively and empoweringly with the future generations that are one day gonna be taking care of us when we're all old timers. So think about that. Continuous reflection, it builds up your, 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 your abilities in connecting with the students because I can tell you right now, if I had not engaged in continuous self-reflection from a critical point of view, I don't think I would have lasted 10 years in the classroom because I had to think about, okay, how can I keep continuing to connect with my students? And then the last one, and this may be the most maybe controversial one, is the curriculum. I am of the firm belief, and I've been thinking this way since about 2006 or seven, that the curriculum is a working document. You can change it, you can adjust it. I know there's some liabilities with that mindset, but I also knew that that was all based on conversations I had with my students, especially the ones who always would say, man, social studies is boring. Why do we gotta learn about citizenship? Why gotta we learn about civics? And it, I always wanted to change that. And so I would engage in, in self-reflection that would either enhance the curriculum, make it better, 
or a challenger where I would see something that my students clearly had no connections with and I would adjust it. And so I, I can answer questions about that later, but I just wanted to throw that out there so that you are all aware that curriculum for me has never been um, live hard and teach directly to it. So um, one example of using this framework that really became popular, and this was done by accident, was at the end of every year, and I took meticulous notes on what I did, I realized I had a set list of songs that the students would introduce their peers and myself to. And beginning with that year, 2010 up until 2014, excuse me, I had a lot of songs, especially music genres I would never really would have given the opportunity to listen to or the time to listen to. And so I wanted to share out some of those songs and the rationale behind it. The first one is a country artist who's now sort of transitioned over into pop music. Her name is Casey Musgraves. And at the time she had released a song called Merry Go Round. And we were talking about, I'm trying to remember exactly what we were talking about when it came to how that song entered our, our conversations. But I know we were, we were discuss, oh, we were discussing the uh, Seneca Falls 1846 convention and how many women felt that they needed to express their, their views and their voices in terms of um, resisting the, the inequalities that were there at the time. And I remember one student, she never really said much, but she said, hey, you know, it reminds me of that song by Casey Musgraves. And some of the students like, yeah, and I'm like, who? And so we had this, um, I know it was a bit answer today, but we had a CD player. And so I said, if anytime you want to bring in something to play, bring in a CD and just pop it in. And so she walked up, popped the CD and started playing it. And I listened to the lyrics and the lyrics really dealt with having to grow in a Southern setting, very rural, very conservative. Um, women have particular roles in society and the, the character in the song was resisting that, saying, no, it's not fair. Why do we get paid less? Why is that we have to act a certain way? And the fact that that student had made that connection using that song for the Seneca Falls Convention, I thought, yes. So we delved deeper into the lyrics and we made additional connections. By the end of that year, that student was so excited about social studies that today, she, I believe she's a junior or senior in college majoring in history. I would have never, I mean, it was for me seeing that aha moment I was like, okay, yeah, I have to bring that into the conversation here. Uh, previous, my previous institution, I was living in Baltimore, Maryland. And so I was teaching elementary social studies. Looking at how we can talk about citizenship education. And one of the students raised their hand and said, hey, what about What About Us by Pink? And I said, oh yeah, my wife loves that song. She's singing in the car. She goes, no, listen to the lyrics. We listened to the lyrics and we thought, wait a minute, there's some in-between stuff here that we need to dig in. And that student said, yeah, my 12th grade AP US history teacher, we were talking about the, the post-civil rights movement effect and she played that song and we thought, wow. So then how do you tie that with a fourth or fifth grade class? And said, you know, break up the lyrics into chunks and connect those with the experiences those students are having. All right, what? right there. A song that has been easily been a pop song, it was a hit for Pink, all of a sudden took on this whole other life. Going back to my K-12 experiences, uh, I had one student who had come over from um, Nigeria to North Carolina, and we were learning about Africa during that unit. And just some generalities about, you know, Western Africa, North Africa, South Africa, East Africa, Central. And he said, hey, can I play a song about Africa that my cousin turned me on to? And so, just like I said before, everybody had, a C had access to the CD player. He popped a CD in and the song Land of Promise came in. And I already knew the song because I'm, you know, growing up in New York City and being exposed to the hip hop, I was a big Nas fan. But he then hearing that song and hearing how the for a long time, Africa was viewed with deficit perspectives, but these two artists said, no, 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 Africa is a source of spiritual enhancement. It is a source of cultural strength and et cetera. And that's what the student wanted to tell us that 
in Africa, they view, they had viewed themselves positively, but then when he came over to the States, all of a sudden people were like, oh, there's a mission trip going to Africa, or, or we're putting water wells into Central African countries. All these things that made it seem that things were wrong. He said, no, we're, we're actually the opposite of that. And so we talked about that and really dug in deep into notions of uh, of deficit perspectives of others and how we view other groups of people. People, excuse me. And then going back to that year when I when I mentioned that my father had passed away, uh, the students asked me, "What is that one song that you kept listening to?" And I said, "Bruce Springsteen, Atlantic City." Uh, if you're a Bruce Springsteen fan, you know that this song is very. It's a very dark song, but it's also talking about a uh, a protagonist who's a working class guy who's struggling and realizing that he has to do things in order to save himself, et cetera. And I made those connections with how I grew up with my dad and everything. And so I brought that into the conversation when we looked at different economic classes within our unit and the idea that for some folks, it's just difficult for other folks. Sometimes they have to resort to doing things that they typically would not do. And all these songs throughout the, my career have really, spark those conversations that once those students leave my classroom, they then take it to the next arena. So mentioning this song here, Pink, uh, that student is now teaching fifth grade in Baltimore and she uses music extensively. I talked about Casey Musgraves and some of the other students, they're, they're, they've gone into music or the arts, but they, they are aware of the issues that are going on in our society today and they are present and involved. And so where do we go from here? And, and uh, something I'm gonna keep stressing is that these songs, how you use them as elements to learn with, not to learn from, are going to influence how students view citizenship history and beyond. Th I'm gonna bring this example. You think of, and I mentioned him before, Billy Joel, We Didn't Start the Fire. There's not a single high school in the US that has not had that song play in their classroom when it comes to the 50s or 60s. But what I've learned from my experiences doing research and from working in K-12 settings is that a lot of times a teacher will put that song in and just let the song teach the students. You don't want that. You want to use that song as a springboard to then ask those questions about, you know, why is it that he's mentioning JFK gone away or whatever, I don't know. I'm not a big Joel fan, but I'm just trying to think of like the lyrics of that song. Why is it that so many different schools use that song? Or um, why is it that he names all these people? It's all males, but he only mentions two females. You know, why is it? Those conversations, it influences how students perceive their worlds around them. Secondary classrooms especially use music. They're listening to it. They, you'll probably see them walking in with their earbuds in, they're probably bopping their head. They're probably listening to the new Drake album or um, whoever whoever's hot right now or Megan Thee Stallion. I know that's another artist that a lot of high schools are into. Make make those connections. Bring that bring that music into the classroom and make and 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 have them speak to why is it that they connect with these artists. And then for those of you who are possibly considering going into um, advanced graduate work or considering a PhD, what are you gonna do when you get to, a, to work in a teacher education setting? How are you going to introduce music? How are you going to allow music to be part of training educators and influencing how they're gonna participate in our democratic society? And then lastly, and this has sort of been pronounced throughout the presentation, it's the future. You have those students right now in your classroom that are learning from you, they're learning with you. But the thing is, whatever you, the conversations are in those classrooms, when they leave, they're gonna be thinking about it, especially now with social media where it's easy for us just to type something and boom, it's out there. Think about how we can influence those students to make choices that's going to better our society. Because as we know, 2020 has been a very difficult year. I don't care where you are in the political spectrum. It's just been a very difficult year. What can we do in the future to make our society better? Okay. So I've spoken enough. Um, I've said enough. I want to hear from all of you now. So we're going back to the short activity that we started. And 
what I want you to do is I want, to sh I want you to share out your song, your definition and for the reasons. And I included this takeaway question if you wanted to answer it there or if you wanted to use it as a springboard, but how will you incorporate music into your instruction and your curriculum? So I'm gonna stop sharing here. And if you want to jump ahead with your song, the reasons and how you define citizenship education. I've done the, um... I've done the, uh, we didn't start the fire one. Um, yeah, at the end of, of the unit, um, we've done that. I gave them the lyrics and mm -hmm. um, I explained it to them. I didn't just run the song. Um, they seem to get a lot out of it, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. I'm glad that you gave them the set of lyrics. Oh, we did, and yeah. And, and the fact that you gave them the opportunities to dive into it instead of just, like I said, laying the music play and say, okay, no. here's all five minutes where I don't have to teach, boom. Um, no. What kind of, what kind of follow-up responses or questions did they have? Well, we worked, uh, I said we, because it was my uh, whole colleagues, we did it as a team. And a couple of us, uh, they had some projects. Some people uh, had them work on particular uh, verses and they could do something with that. Uh, others, they had to focus on a particular, uh, you know, again, the verses and, and what it meant to them. You know, you know some of them loved the, the, the pill, right? When that came out and, oh, that was so late. And yeah, it, it brought some really good discussion though. It, 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 it was a couple of days with that in my classroom. I didn't choose the, the project. I chose the discussion of it. Mm -hmm. We did discussion in my room. I think that's great that those com initial thoughts extended into a couple of days, which I know I, it being a teacher and having a pacing guide or a set number of days, I think if you let it organically develop like you did, they really start to dig in and start to ask those questions. And um, yeah, no, that's great. I'm, gl I'm glad you were able to use that song in a very proactive way. Mm. Yeah, I think Henry had a something to say. <laughs> okay. Um, if uh, is that okay, uh, Professor Ender? If I give an example, actually, that I did when I was doing, uh, actually last uh, this spring. So I actually um taught, I played the song "Inmate Four Eight Five Nine by Sabaton. It's about what's a uh, Polchak. Uh, so I then brought the idea of um was really a hero. So. Actually, the cool thing is that we got, uh, at least I was doing this with my parents because we could not actually do that in school. Oh, as I would have done that in like a school, but I was able to do this with my parents uh, mainly for my, uh, for proof of my education thing. And then we oddly enough um, started, since one of the heroes I actually talked about, um, we actually ended up actually, they ended up trying to build a song that uh, was about, um, the uh, Jamaican um, Norse, who basically um, is a very famous Jamaican Norse, who played a very pivotal role in the Crimean War, and they decided, okay, we're going to actually try and do a reggae song around it because of the power of um, reggae and different songs to actually show her as a hero when a lot of people don't know her. And I always, um, uh, she's really cool, and I wish I could actually remember her proper name right now, but. Uh, She's very cool, that sadly um, thing. So at least for me, hmm. the power of um, using music is that you can get people interested and connect in different ways that you wouldn't have expected people to actually um, connect. And part of the reason will come, at least for me, uh, for citizenship, we want our students to be able to question things. We want them to be able to actually um, try and connect in different ways. So like uh, you have said, so at least for me, that's part of the reason why um, I, I really like using music. And that's at least the song that I thought of when I when you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, thank, thank you for sharing that out, Henry. Um, I'm, I'm curious, where, where, where'd you hear that song for the first time? I heard that song because I am a Sabaton fan, <laughs> but, um, okay. it's, but I will admit, uh, it's also, um, uh, also I, a lot of my teachers would try and use um, different um, metal songs, sadly enough, um, from, from Sabaton and other different uh, bands. Uh, 
uh, for example, they would do um, sometimes Iron Maiden. If they want to describe um, what happened to uh, Native Americans, they would play uh, Run to the Hills, or they would do um, the Raiders, um, Indian Reservation. They would do stuff like that. Yeah. So we would go over songs like that. Um, so we would have different um, connections. So, but Sabaton, I knew before. And then, yeah, lucky enough, um, one of my higher education classes, they actually started actually using that because they want us to connect. So they said, oh, let's see videos, let's see music, let's see different ways of interacting comics, et cetera. Wow. Yeah, I, that, 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 you, just, you just spoke to it. You, the power of music, it makes you think in different ways or helps you understand where different individuals come from. Because that's the thing when it comes to citizenship and democracy, we all come from different points of view. We all have different experiences. There is not one, contrary to popular belief, we don't all hold blanketed views on different things or, um, yeah, we may have shared experiences, but how we live and interpret our world are very unique to us. And something like that where, yeah, you got the power of music, but it's, it's looking from a particular point of view using a particular genre, it's gonna make folks think, whoa, that's different. And it's gonna start making them ask those questions like, wow, how, why, why did that artist come up with a song like that? Or how did they come up with it or et cetera? But no, but thanks for sharing that out. Um, my name is Andrew Vince. Uh, I, I teach um, high school uh, history, uh, social studies and history. Um, but a couple of things Hi, that I've used um, with, uh, I've used Kendrick Lamar as a King Kunta for mm -hmm. um, talking about like, slavery and second middle passage and stuff like that expansion of slavery um i've done all right with um reconstruction kendrick lamar's all right with a little bit of reconstruction um and then with um the rise of fascism in europe uh the clamp down by the clash so uh and i found right. that yep. like using some of those like lyrics like very specific you know specifically taking some excerpts has definitely kind of helped students really connect with the material beyond, um, you know, your, your, your standard set. But I think, it, I think it really has helped students connect, so. Absolutely, and, and for the record, I'm an unabashed class fan that I even have my class nice. t-shirt on. Nice, Because I, that was one of the first artists as a kid that really opened up, you know, they're, they're very English sounding, but yet their sounds were Jamaican influenced or they had a, elements of of other genres and the the lyrics themselves I, I remember as a kid watching the rock in the castle video and, and mm. seeing um the oil rigs and all that i was like mm. whoa but yeah clamp down and kenneth lamar those are artists right there that i know excuse me that the students would be like oh get engaged in the mm. conversation like you said So one, this is going to sound probably a little bit corny, but one song that I thought of was We Shall Overcome by Bob Seger mm, when, talk, when yeah. coming to, when discussing civil engagement, because one, it shows that um, getting information out can come from all sources and any, in any realm can use the power of music to convey messages, but also shows that music, lyrics within the music aren't always static, they can change. So I know, yep. for instance, uh, that song, We Shall Overcome, has been used by multiple um, movements of rights. The environmental has substitutes and things out and yep. put clean air, clean water, and all that in there. So that's one song that came to my mind because it's like, it's not, it's not static. It's not just in that moment. So it also shows that music can change or like the original lyrics can change to fit different modes and different time periods. Another, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Clef with Vietnam, when the mm -hmm. Iraq war started in Afghanistan, he just changed the word from Vietnam to Afghanistan and it has the same meaning. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point about how music is, is the opposite of static and, and you can apply it for different situations or different moments or different time periods. and hearing you mention we shall overcome yeah i could i could see in three or four different areas that that song has been used to engage with different folks or um the song uh, give me some truth by john lennon i know folks have adapt readapted that song for when 
um, Clinton was president or Bush was president or currently with Trump being his president. So it's just, there are a lot, there are a lot of ways that music can speak to us. And that's one way to, to counter that staticism that comes with um, learning history. So um, I know we're coming up to the four o'clock hours. So I just wanted to, to make sure if there are any other questions that I could answer. Uh, um, One question is, um, so I've used music in a couple of micro lessons. Mm -hmm. um, would you play the same song as the introduction and as a conclusion to kind of do a full circle? Sure. Or would you play one, one song for, to introduce it and another more advanced song to end the unit? Or You can do either one. It depends on the students you're working with. And that's when, that's when you get, that's when you've already had that trusting relationship built up with them so that if you know that they would benefit from hearing one song at the start of the unit and then that same song at the end to see how much they've grown or do an aspect of one song and do a completely different song later on that 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 all that is all dependent on on what your pulse is on the classroom itself but yeah either one would work Well, it's, it's going to be four o'clock in like 30 seconds. Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I, just a couple of questions. Um, so yeah. obviously like, like the most direct connection is like analyzing lyrics. Um, yeah. But have you, have you had students kind of um, maybe going beyond like the direct lyrical connection? Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember here. There were a couple of times that, yeah, it, that did happen. But I think what what had what was in place in the classroom was that some of the other students would be like, oh, no, wait, hold on. You have to look at it from this point of view. Or like, oh, wait, no, look look at the next. So they would work with each other instead of me saying, well, what you're thinking is not quite. The the peer-to-peer the, the -peer interaction is what I had hoped would take place because it's easier for one student to hear a friend of theirs or a peer of theirs say, hey, try the next set of lyrics or hey, what is it about the time period that, and let them do that conversation and me sort of just guide it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's where it goes back to what I mentioned to, to David. It's, it's hoping that the trust is there with your students that they can self guide each other or peer guide each other. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess like in a follow up question to that, um, have you had kids, have you, have you had kids like create their own music? I mean, even just like lyrically or in. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I, my, that, my last year as an eighth grade teacher, I had one kid who is now, he, he's, uh, he has an Instagram page of over, I think like 10,000 followers because he's making a form of hip hop that is important to him. But yeah, he took, especially when we were drawing in artists like Gil Scott Heron and some of the early hip hoppers, and he just would put a beat on his Mac MacBook and just start dropping rhymes on top. And I said, wow, this is, this is some heavy stuff. And then it just built off of there. So yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, especially if you have a kid who's willing to share it out. It's one thing if they're creating it and you hear it by word of mouth, but then if it's another student who's like, hey, um, Mr. Vince, can, can I, can I play this? And you're like, if you want to, go for it. And then you have the conversations after that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, wait. well, thank you again for, for coming to check this out. Like I said, um, I'm a Rhode Island college, so you can look me up or on Twitter um, if you wanted to just keep in touch. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of the conference. I know it lasts till next month. So Hopefully, I'll get to meet all of you in person at next year's conference. Take care, all.